new videos every day. In fact, what science does a lot of times is if they want a particular protein to say make a medication or some type of material or something, uh, they'll actually biologically modify an organism in order to produce this protein, right? Uh, and to give you an example of that, recently uh, we decoded the gene for a black widow spider, spider silk, right? Now, spider silk is incredibly strong. In fact, it's stronger than any man-made particular rope or material. So uh, they actually want to make, use a spider silk protein in order to make armor, kind of like a bulletproof vest or uh, a military light sort of jacket, right? Um, and it can't be synthesized in a laboratory, so how do they do it? Obviously, you can't harvest enough spider silk from black widows in order to make a vest out of it. So what they want to do is they want to take the gene sequence and they want to stick it into like a cow or a sheep or something or, or a large animal that will produce a lot of it so that it can be effectively harvested and then people can use it to make armor or whatever they want to make with it, really strong rope. So proteins are so complex, though, that we can't synthesize them in laboratories a lot of times, and it's actually easier to genetically modify an organism than to come up with some chemical process in order to synthesize it. Now, here we're at the protein. So proteins are complex. So what about how do we get to the cell, from the protein to the cell? Now, cells have millions of proteins in them. Um, and they also have a lot of different types of proteins, like the simplest organism that we have found has at least 1,300 proteins in it, 1,300 individual different types of protein in it, right? That's not the total number of proteins, but the individual types. Uh, it probably actually has millions of different protein molecules that make up that particular cellular organism. So to get from a protein to a cell is actually a much larger gap than to get from, say, an amino acid to a protein, which is larger than to get from an atom to an amino acid, right? Now, one thing you'll hear people that talk about abiogenesis talk about is something called the Miller experiment. And what this is, is a guy put the different chemicals that are thought to have been in the primeval earth and uh, put them together in kind of a tube sort of thing or a large apparatus, heated it up, electrified it, did various things to it. So he pulls out the soup and he gets various organic molecules, right? Now, people use that as evidence for abiogenesis, but, you know, here's the deal with that. Um... Organic molecules are just carbon-based molecules. So you throw some carbon in with some other elements and you electrify it and heat it and do various things to it. And then you become extremely impressed when you came up with a carbon-based molecule. <laughs> okay, now when this guy did this experiment, he actually got 13 of the 20 amino acids that are encoded in the DNA. So you might go, well, pretty impressive. But... Like I said, you know, an amino, an amino acid maybe needs, you know, 15, 30 different, different atoms to come together in the right air, way. So it's, it's really not very impressive. In fact, if you, uh, learn a little bit about amino acids, even though our DNA encodes 20 of them, there are other types of amino acids. There's more than a hundred of them. They do occur in nature non-biologically. So uh, chemical processes do develop amino acids, right? If you want to understand where life came from, it's probably a good idea to look at the simplest form of life. That would probably make sense. Uh, the simplest true living organism that science has located is a bacterium that lives in the ocean that's called SAR11 or SAR11. So it's a pretty interesting little critter. And actually, 25% of all microbial organisms on this planet are this single type of bacteria, right? 
Um, now this little guy, this little bacteria, and he is actually very little, he's smaller than any other bacteria, has 1.3 million base pairs of DNA. Um, there's no junk DNA. There are no duplicate genes. There are no viral DNA in the genome of this little creature. So it's all genes, and it's 1.3 million base pairs, right? In this 1.3 million base pairs of DNA, there are about 1,300 genes. So you can guess this guy's got a lot of different proteins, right? Maybe about 1,200 of them. Um, now that's the simplest form of life. What science has to do with abiogenesis is it's got to explain how can we get from an atom, which is something very simple, to this little simple organism that has 1.3 million base pairs of DNA and which encodes over 1,200 genes, right? Um, so you're talking very simple to very complex. Now, you'll hear atheists on YouTube bitch about how theists fill gaps with the supernatural or gaps in science with the supernatural. But, uh, you know, here's the thing. Science actually fills those gaps, too. And science fills those gaps with theoretical things that don't exist. So let's talk for a second about these theoretical things that don't exist in this theory of abiogenesis. Mm -hmm.